We are back. You are listening to Live from the Heartland at WLUW 88.7 FM on your dial, Chicago Sound Alliance. I just got brought back to my youth by Marty McMorrow, an uh, old uh, buddy from the uh, Loyola and Mundelein days. Um, now I am meeting for the first time Arno Michaels and Sammy Rangel. Hi, you guys. Welcome. Thanks, Katie. Uh, very grateful for the Heartland Cafe to uh, have us here and also thankful for In the Garden Ministries for uh, bringing us to Chicago and setting this up. Which garden ministries? In the Garden Ministries. Oh, okay. Cool. And that's Jeff over there. Jeff hey, Winkowski Jeff. right over there. Um, Who works at the diner, Chicago Diner. Right on. Good. Serving uh, people we helped to awesome. inspire the Chicago <laughs> Diner. <laughs> we got to wow. get Mickey on the show, too. And All Joe. Right. Um, you guys, um, I'm going to start probably at the end because you met each other uh, in, way after some of the more formative and awful things that were parts of your, your individual journeys. Where did you meet and, um, and how? Well, um, me and Denise, my wife, um, we're doing... Sammy's it. talking. Yes. Me and Denise, my wife, were doing a Channel 58 show, and they sent it to Chicago to have uh, some of the edits done. Uh-huh. And a friend there knew Arno and suggested through Facebook that we become friends. And uh, boy, let me tell you, that started a whirlwind. Um, eight days after I met Arno, uh, in July 28th of 2010, I discovered, within eight days, I, I discovered I had a brother I never knew, and I found him. Uh, after being told that he was dead within that week period. And then since then, um, me and Arno have finished my book, been to Ireland, uh, started a um, Kindness Not Weakness anti-bully program, na- a national program, and got our Life After Hate organization, uh, 5013 Seed, recently. Um, and Arno, had you already started Life After Hate magazine when you met each other? Yeah, Life After Hate was launched in January of 2010. And uh, can I? Yeah. Okay. I, it's this, yeah, I think this would be better for it. Jan- Life After Hate was launched in January 2010, and it was really a self-publishing venture of the book you see before you. Uh-huh. Uh, early chapters of the book were published piecemeal in the first few issues of Life After Hate. And um, the stories that we published and the the readers we attracted and the writers we attracted included the woman that Sammy referred to. Miss Denise. uh, Actually, uh, her name was Tamara Westfall. And she was uh, doing the uh, closed caption for the news piece on Sammy while she was working at a Chicago TV station. And that's how Sammy and I came to know each other. And And you both grew up in Wisconsin? No, you did not. I, I grew up here. Um, yeah, here in right Chicago. Here in Chicago, uh-huh. uh, in the suburbs. My family lived all over. We were poor, so you know, as soon as we burnt up the rent money, we moved to somewhere else. And so it was, it's kind of a scattered childhood. But by the time I was 11 years old, I was on my own and would go back and forth between various suburbs in the north side of Chicago. But uh, I've been in Racine, Wisconsin for the last 12 years. Uh, it was... Um more than uh, horrifying to read what you went through as a young ma- young boy, mm-hmm. as a boy, and which is how you wound up on your own at 11. Um, I'm grateful you hung in there. I need a little clarification because uh, Arno, your book uh, talks about uh, and you, you know your life experience. You you uh, you confess. I'll use that word to having been a sure. a racist, That's uh, a fair word. Uh, you know, a white supremacist. Sure. And uh, you guys are linked up today. Now, Sammy is, uh, I think you're Mexican and uh, Mescalero Apache. Yes. And uh, so were you into well the, done, the, the racist stuff too, or were you just into the bullying part? Well, you know, <laughs> I, I joined the gang as soon as I hit the streets. I mean, within six months, I was a gang member, doing drugs, having sex. I buried my first kid by the time I was 12. Um, I had been homeless since then, pretty much through my adolescent years. It wasn't until I, I was 17 that I think the racism hit me. Uh, I was doing time at a prison here in Illinois called Menard Correctional Center. Uh, very and, familiar. Um, I picked you know, up a Native American buddy of mine out of there when he got out. Sure, sure. You know, long and, and ride from Chicago. Long ride, eight hours at least. Um, and it's the only prison that's run by the white supremacist gangs. All the other prisons, mediums and maximums, are run by the Latino and black gangs. So it was kind of a culture shock to get sent down there. Um, 
and then that's I, I walked into a race riot. And uh, I think based on the things that I saw and maybe some poor coping skills, I just developed some real hatred towards white people, primarily because of what a, a, a few hateful people had done and mm -hmm. were doing. But uh, at that time, I didn't know enough not to blame everyone, so I just grouped everyone in that hateful part of my life. And Arno, then, your version of where'd you learn hate? Hate for me was really... Um, it was my failure to, to process my the, the emotional violence that was in my house growing up uh, due to living in an alcoholic household and unable to find a healthy outlet for that anger. And it, combined with the fact that I was really kind of unchallenged and I, I didn't engage with any healthy challenges that were presented to me. And so I, I was looking to lash out at the world, and w when I became a, a white power skinhead, I did it really because it was the, the most effective means of, of pissing people off that I had come across to that time. Um, and, and that was really what attracted me to it, much more so than the racism itself. But the racism was just kind of went along with the, the lashing out. It, it was a byproduct at first. However, once I started practicing hate and violence, the, the world responded to me with hate and violence that seemed to validate and seemed to justify uh, the, the, the hate that I was practicing. Hate. I don't know, Michaels, I thought it was interesting yesterday when uh, we met each other and we talked briefly in the, in the Buffalo Bar here at the Heartland Cafe. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we talked a little bit about your, your father who uh, didn't seem to be so upset that you were a racist and you were into hate, but how you were going to make a living. You want to, I mean, was your family, uh, was your family racist or were, I'm not that most white people aren't a little racist. Right, but. right. I, uh, my family wasn't racist and, and my, my father was, it would be fair to say he was more concerned with me earning a living than uh, my, my choice of ideology. However, I, my, my dad's an extremely compassionate person, and, and he's grown incredibly since those days also. So, you know, who am I to begrudge anyone a healthy change? And as a matter of fact, my dad's healthy change has been really inspirational on my own, and I, I've been uh, kind of following in his footsteps since uh, then. Transformation is such a, a key of, of both of your stories, and I, it's, it just proves, says to me, if you live long enough, if you hang in there and you keep your uh, continue to open up your heart, uh, all all, th all things are possible. Uh, can I ask you just this? Because you start with uh, saying that Life After Hate, the magazine and the organization, start as an apology. Um, what is apology? It, to me, an, an apology is first of all admitting you were wrong. Um, and, it, you know, depending on the magnitude of, of your transgression, that, that could be a very difficult thing to do. And uh, there are people who live their entire lives without apologizing for uh, things that they, they perhaps should have. Uh, Sammy and I have both made catastrophic mistakes that have caused a lot of harm to the world around us. And, and there are still people suffering because of, because of that harm that we caused. So I, I think... Uh, an apology is, is a great way for the, that first step to happen, but very shortly after Life After Hate was launched, it became so much more of an apology than an apology. It became a, a kind of a group practice Clearly. of compassion and uh, kindness and, and forgiveness, for, both for our, ourselves, first of all, and um, it, you know, especially in Sammy's case, he, he had to forgive a lot of other people that uh, really deprived him, him of the childhood that he should have had. Right. And, and, and people who are still not remorseful for what they've done to us or to me and my family. And what is that like? I mean, how do you hold them right now in your current manifestation? They're not apologizing. They don't feel what you, you feel about what went down. How do you make room for them, or do you still have walls up to protect yourself? 
the only walls that are there are the ones I think are necessary, uh, but none of them are mental or emotional walls. It's it's just they're not safe for me in my life. Hmm. Um, in that sense, I, I that's, have that's a clarity right there. Sure, you know, and I have no hate left. I have no regret, and I have to remember that from time to time because those those old memories and those old ways of feeling, especially when I found out that my mom had beaten my brother with a Tonka truck almost to death when he was 20 months old. I'm 42 when I found that out. And she, to, you know, to realize all the secrets she kept from me weren't still revealed to me at the age of 42. And to know that, you know, I, I kind of humorously said in my book, I went right to the source when I wanted to know what happened to my brother, which was the internet. Because I knew I couldn't go to my mom and I knew I couldn't go to my sister because they, their, their mentality and their, their emotional mentality is still the same. Uh, but I was able to process that because I think I practiced so much of that that it really only took me about eight days to get beyond what I was struggling with and then to focus back on my, you know, my philosophy finding of forgiveness and finding my brother and mm -hmm. trying to complete that circle in my life. We're talking to Arno Michaels and uh, Sammy Rangel, both authors and both working on getting to a life after hate, which My Life After Hate is the title of Arno's book and Forebears, Myths of Forgiveness for Sammy. And um, you are listening to the Live from the Heartland show on WLUW 88.7 Chicago Sound Alliance. Uh, when I met you yesterday, uh, Arno, uh, you, you said that, uh, well, first of all, let me, let me say you gentlemen are going to be here at the Heartland tomorrow night for a oh, performance yeah. or a book reading. Let's, uh, yeah. let's hear a little bit Yay. about that. And then I have uh, some questions that I, I hope will, uh, will get us to another level. Uh, we're really excited about doing the reading tomorrow. Um, Sammy and I have done a, a couple of these together previously, and uh, you know, we're, we're basically going to read a chapter or two from our books, and then we'll talk about them, take some Q&A, and, &A, and uh, it, it's really the most rewarding part about that is interacting with uh, people and, and answering questions and, and asking them questions. What time well. does that kick off here tomorrow night? Uh, I think I would say 7, 7, 7 p.m. 7 p.m. <laughs> yeah, it'll it'll go as long as people are interested in talking with one another right here at the you stage of the Heartland Cafe. Into now. <laughs> well, you know, well, there, there are things as licenses. <laughs> there are times where we go, you get to go home now. Well, when we talked yesterday, but, you said that you that both of you were going to be going to a gang conference in L.A. Correct. Um, and then, uh, so, and I mentioned to you that I had worked with a lot of uh, neighborhood groups, gangs. Uh, I had come out of a group before we did the Heartland called Rising Up Angry. Uh, and it was uh, kind of the, the white working class wing of the Rainbow Coalition with the Black Panther Party and the Young Lords Organization. And in looking at the promotion for uh, this show, for your books, uh, there's a lot of stuff about personal injury and uh, individual things, but nowhere do I find a critique of the system. Uh, and I'm just wondering where you're at on that, because, you know, we would always, I mean, I understand that uh, the social, economic, and political forces lead to conditions that shape people's lives, and that we have to work on those through psychiatry, through small groups, through help, a lot of the things that you gentlemen have experienced. But on the other hand, one of the things that we used to put out, that I still put out there, is that we are living in an economic and political system that is really about people not being able to achieve the kind of harmony we would like to see. And I'm just wondering where you're at on that. Um, uh, you know, we were political people from a political movement in the 60s into the 70s, and we certainly have those conditions around today where people are getting poorer, and uh, you're dealing with uh, the results of those conditions for a lot of people. Do you ever, in your own lives, address or are, are you think about the, the overall structural reasons why th these things happen? Uh, following me? I, I'm following you exactly, and, and I, I agree there are systemic issues in the society that contribute to all sorts of social ills. Um, however, regardless of societal conditions, it, it really comes down to the individual as to how they react to those conditions. And uh, we... At Life After Eight, we talk about personal responsibility quite a bit. Sure. And the reason why I love to use that term is because uh, it's such a, a buzzword of, of the right wing. However, <laughs> it, in my 
perspective, personal responsibility does not end once your bills are paid. That's where it begins. Right. Personal responsibility begins with being responsible for your, Im the impact of your actions on yourself, on your family, on your community, on your society, on your country, and on the rest of the world, and, and, and the, planet the planet that we all share. Yeah. So until you are extending your sphere of personal responsibility as far outward as you can, um, I, I kind of get a kick out of anyone who claims that they're personally responsible once they say, well, I pay my bills, I don't care about anybody else. Sammy, do you have a... That's, that's, that's incredibly that's irresponsible that's as far as I'm no, concerned. I think these things go together. Yeah, if you can, yeah, if you can wrench it away. Um, you know, I was never more political than when I was a gangbanger. You know, because I was a, I, I've always said I've always gotten the I've always gotten the diagnosis because of other people's symptoms. You know, um, what is the proper response to physical abuse or social indifference to that uh, abuse? I, you know, I, I challenge anyone to tell me how an 11-year-old kid is supposed to know how to deal with being raped, with being starved, and then with reporting it to a society at that time that seemed like nothing but white faces, right. and then and then having nothing done about some of the most brutal you know, uh, uh, punishment that somebody could be going through. Right. Today, my book does challenge uh, social norms and, and some of the stances, and, and directly and indirectly, because we do believe that we're dealing with individuals who then control larger institutions, and we believe that we can help change mindsets. And I think me and Arno, we challenge that, but we try to do it in a compassionate way without trying to overpower people with our ideas. Because you, you mentioned being open-minded, Minded, well, we can also tolerate then other people having differences uh, of opinion about what we're Absolutely. doing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Arno, um, you are uh, also a walking billboard. You've got a lot of ink. <laughs> I am. Um, you are one of the people that probably could uh, say to young people today, be careful what you put on your body. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, how do you, uh, I know you, in your book, you, you had a swastika on your hand for a while. Correct. And um, it was very telling, by the way, to me, what, that you mentioned early in your skinhead days, walking into a McDonald's, being waited on by an African-American woman who was very kind to you, right. but who absolutely didn't veer away from saying, what's that on your hand? Exactly. Oh. And you could not say say, it's against you, I'm blah, blah, blah. you had to say, oh, it's nothing. And you got pounded by your friend for, and you walked out by, for backing down. Yep. So it was that little sliver of humanity, you couldn't help it. You, I, could, you had no power to, to withhold. I was absolutely defenseless in the face of compassion. Yeah. No, that swastika that was on Let's my, remember that I line. love you guys. That's a good line. <laughs> the swastika that was... Thanks a lot. <laughs> and, and that, if you take nothing else away from this conversation, please take that, because that, that's, that's really what it boils down to. That swastika that was on my middle finger was there for a reason. Say, oh, you know, this is what I'm about. Yeah. This is what this swastika means. Now, people who responded to that with anger... We're doing we're exactly on. what I wanted them to do. <laughs> right. I was looking for a fight. I was looking to, to enrage people. So when I did enrage people, it was mission accomplished. You were me. successful. They were giving That's me everything right. I wanted, and I became more hateful and more violent. And something I said many times before, and I'll say it many times again, especially when I'm talking to Young very... People good-minded, socially conscious people who are kind of naturally responding to racism with anger and, and aggression of their own, the thing to remember is this. Nobody ever beat the Nazi out of me. Mm -hmm. And no one was, was ever going to. Because the more violence and hatred I encountered in my life, the more violent and hatred I became. However, when I was responded to with compassion, i.e. The, the old lady at McDonald's, i.e. the black and Latino guys I worked with in a factory who were kind to me regardless of the, that I claimed to hate them, those were the people who, who planted seeds that eventually brought me to where I am today. Yeah. And I, I have them to thank, and, and uh, if any of them are listening, thank you very much. I wish we had that big of a reach, um, thousands of <laughs> you, people. You never know. Well, we, you, that's exactly right. Um, what did it do for you all to get the story out, Sammy? This is, a, this is one he heavy tome, and as he pointed out to me, number 10 uh, type, not number 14 like his. 13. 
13. <laughs> Um, well, you know, this. I knew years ago, before I was even thinking about change, that I wanted, I wanted to tell my story. But when I started to tell my story from before, it was with a different headset. When did um, you start writing? I started writing my book when I was in a prison in Wisconsin called uh, Wapan Correctional. Uh -huh. I had been in the prison less than eight hours before I ended up in the hole for another 20 months or so. Um, and I had to start writing my book on toilet paper by the light that was coming in from under the door. I was behind what was called a double door. So it was a large gated door and then a large castle wooden, like six inch door, heavy door. And the light was so dim you couldn't see other than through whatever came through the bottom. Um, and that, that was a chapter about that race riot because that's that I think I was still reeling from the effects of what that had done to me. Um, but getting my story out meant the world to me because I felt that what I had to say uh, was going to bridge a gap between people like me who have suffered and then become uh, hateful, but also people who have suffered and never knew how to recover from that suffering. Um, and in the second half of my book, I concern myself with trying to bridge the gap between people who want to help us and those of us who need the help. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what I've really captured Brilliant. in that voice. Brilliant. I, I'm, we don't, you know, clearly we, tomorrow night will be a great opportunity to delve deeper. But one of the things that I did want to bring up, your program and program uses things like rock climbing yeah. uh, as, which I'm a I, because I live here <laughs> I, I am a permanent amateur rock climber but I have rock There's climbed great gyms in, in Chicago, city, actually. Giant City actually great and city. and uh, no Giant City Giant City and also Devil's Lake Wisconsin but love Devil's Lake all the other big ones too but it, what a great uh, I've always thought Take kids out there, do things like that where they have to depend on each other. You can move mountains. Um, that talk about using uh, what kind of work you do with kids and what the effect is. And well, I, I love doing the climbing most of all, and and it's. We, Let me tell you, these guys have really strong grips. <laughs> I know. I notice these things because I try to. 